Hello and welcome back to Advancing Spot, where this week we are taking a slight change of direction and we're looking at certification. So with the release of Spark 3.0 just a couple of weeks ago, there's now a new exam. You can go and become a certified developer for Apache Spark 3.0 and it's only been out for a couple of weeks. So in the spirit of adventure and experimentation, I went and took the exam last week, passed it with flying colors, and I'm here to give you some advice about how you prep for that exam and how you too can become a certified developer. So don't forget to like and subscribe. Otherwise, buckle up. So first things first, where to find it on the Databricks website, because all the certifications are managed by Databricks. You can find this learn area, and then under there, we've got certification. I'll bring you here. So you've got a few assessments that you can take. And the new one, brand spanking new, is this certified associate developer for Apache Spark 3.0. And there's some advice in here about how you prep for this exam. So a few things, blah, blah, blah. It's how to be a developer. This one, so if you're going to do this exam, you should have a basic understanding of the Spark architecture. And a few of the people that I know that took that exam, when I spoke to them, were like, yeah, no, I wasn't expecting questions about how it actually works under the hood. And I was like, really? Why, why not? Because it's that understanding of how the architecture works and that execution hierarchy is pretty core to how things work. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the Spark uh, architecture and kind of give you some of the stuff that you should know about, or at least that you can go and research to make sure you're ready for that exam. After that stuff, we've got kind of just more general how to be a Spark user. Um, and there's a big, big point to this in that it is all data frame API related. So you pick whether you are a Scala or a Python developer, then all the questions are going to be talking about data frames. Now, it didn't used to be the case. So they changed the exam last year for the Spark 2.4 and made it very, very data frame focused. Prior to that, even though we had the data frame API, there's a lot of expectation that you'd have to know the RDD levels and all the nitty gritty, basically building manual MapReduce under the hood. Now, a lot of that stuff is gone and we're now talking just data frame API stuff. So that's what you do. You're used to manipulating data in the data frames. You're probably going to be all right. So a few other things. There's, there is some uh, recommended stuff. I'll take you through some of that. And the actual exam. So the exam is multiple choice. Now that's new. That is new for this one. So the old exam, it used to have labs. You used to have to write some code and get tested and all that kind of stuff. Now this tells us up front is just 60 multiple choice questions. So you've got two hours, 60 questions, it's not too bad actually to, uh, to get through everything. So I had a good half an hour to spare when I was doing it. So all pretty good. And the other bit is this, you do have a PDF version of the Spark documentation. I'll point you at that and give you some tips about how to prep. It is an entirely online exam. So you'll need a webcam. You'll need to make sure that's positioned off to your side so they can see the whole of your body and your arms and normal online proctoring stuff. If you've taken an online exam before, you'll be fine. If not, there's a big help guide to help you actually understand it. So yeah, fairly straightforward exam, nothing particularly crazy in there. Uh, let's have a talk about Spark Architecture and get you prepped for it. So first thing first, they do recommend this book and I heartily recommend this book. So Spark, the definitive guide written by Bill Chambers and Matei Zaharia, as well as some of the other guys from UC Berkeley, basically written by the guys who invented Spark back in the day, who went on to then found Databricks, they wrote this book. So. Well, that's why it's called the definitive guide, right? Uh, and this is really, really good for getting that low level understanding of how Spark works, what's going on inside it. When you put that command in, what actually happens? Uh, so can't recommend that enough. And yes, there is probably a lot of stuff in there that's not that useful to you if you're just doing the high level kind of data frame API stuff. But even so, it's good to know that stuff. It's good to know how it actually works under the hood. So definitely recommend taking a look, pulling it down. Certainly when we do training sessions and we go and train clients, this is one of the prizes that we give out because it's just such a fundamentally good book. So read it. Okay, so some architecture bits, things that you need to be aware of. So firstly, we're talking about clusters. So generally in a cluster, you have a driver, you have that top level server, and then you have worker servers, worker nodes. So individual separate servers, each with their own CPU, RAM, disks, all that kind of stuff, all working in parallel. So get used to being thinking about it as drivers and workers and how many workers do I have and then what's going on inside each worker. Now with current Spark, it all runs inside a JVM. So Spark's largely written in Scala and Java. It all compiles down to Java bytecode, meaning it has to run inside a JVM. 
And that's why we have some weirdness with Python interrupts, NOLA interrupts, and all of that kind of stuff. So on each of our workers and our driver, we have a JVM, and then our Spark application and our Spark um, executors are running inside those JVMs. Now, Databricks way of doing things and the standard way of doing things is one JV, one executor to one JVM to one server. So I just have nice one executor. That's my executor server. That's my executor server. I've got lots of them. Now you can, if you're building your own Spark cluster, you can set up multiple JVMs on a single one and build it out as much as you want. You can use Kubernetes, you can do whatever you want. Just be aware that you've got this idea of an executor sitting inside a JVM, and then you have many of them that are controlled by that driver. Okay, and then inside each executor, we've got this thing called slots. Essentially, how many CPU do I have? Essentially, how much work can I do in parallel? So a slot is an individual, independent unit of capacity to do work. So one server with four cores can be doing four things at once, essentially. So each worker has a JVM, has an executor, each executor has a number of slots, and then you've got a total number of slots, is how much work you can be doing in parallel. Okay, so remember that, keep it in your brain. On the other side, we've got actually how it does work. So if I've got a little bit of Python, I'm saying spark.read, go and read some data in, filter it, join it, write it. I've got these different commands I can give to the data frame API. And there's two types I've got there. So the top ones, so reading things, filtering things, joining things, these are all transformations. These are all things I'm gonna manipulate and change the data, but they're not actually doing anything. So I can line up a thousand different transformations. I can keep saying, and join this and filter this and rename that column, add a new column and just bang, 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 bang. And each time I'll go, okay, sure. And I'll just add it to its list of transformations that it does. And it won't do them until I call that second thing, until I call an action. Now transformations have got two main types. So I've got narrow and wide transformations. And that depends on whether I need to change how the data is stored. So I've got my data held in two big chunks, and then I try and do something like a join. A join is a wide transformation. So say if I had my data held across two different servers, and actually I need to join it to another table, maybe that executor has the data I need for that bit of data, and that one has the one I need for that bit of data, and the current way I've stored my data is not gonna work. I need to pull my data down, reorganize it, put it back up again. So that's called a shuffle. So if I'm having to reorganize my data to do that transformation, that's a wide transformation. If I can do it in situ with how the data is currently held, that's narrow. So understand your transformations, know which are narrow and which are wide and kind of why it works that way. Then I've got my action. So if I'm trying to write something, I'm trying to collect it, I'm trying to read it, not read it, read not an action. <laughs> so I'm trying to write it, I'm trying to um, collect it, I'm trying to count it, I'm trying to display it. And I think that actually it needs to have read the data in order to do it, that's going to be an action. So knowing which are transformations, which are actions and how they work, going to set you in good stead. And you should be thinking about that stuff anyway. Okay, so when I actually submit that and I go, here's the work, go and do something. As we're saying, maybe I had those two blocks of data. So I had two files on disk and it's read it in via two of my CPUs. So I've got two blocks of data. Now, actually those blocks, they're called RDDs, Resilient Distributed Data Sets. But it's mainly think about, I've got two chunks of data. And then I do my join and I have to go, well, actually I'm spreading it out there. I need to join it over there. I need that bit over there. I change how my data is structured. So I do this thing called a shuffle. So now I'm kind of changing how many chunks my data is in, how many RDD blocks my data is in, spreading it out again. And then maybe I'm doing my write and I've told it in my write, I want it to be four files that get created at the end of this, repartition down to four partitions when I do my write. And so it has to do a shuffle again and then makes it into four blocks of data. So you've always got that idea when I'm trying to work all my way through a list of commands to actually produce the intended results, I'm going to have several different layers. Um, and there's terminology for each of these different bits that you guys need to know. So this whole viewpoint of going some work, a shuffle, another shuffle. So this whole thing's called a job. So I've given in this bit of work and said, there's a thing to go and do, that is a job. And then each of my different collections of bits of work that can do without a shuffle is called a stage. So at the top, I'm doing a bit of work. I can do all those bits of work in parallel, stage one, and then I have to do a shuffle and then I've got more work to do. By the time, I've, because I've done a shuffle, I'm into a separate stage. 
and then I have to do another shuffle and I've got a separate stage. So a lot of the time when you've got a job and you, you know, if you're in Databricks and you go select staff from and you just do a quick query and it'll go job submitted, you open that and you'll see several stages. That's because it's having to do several shuffles. Okay, and then inside each one of those stages, we've got those different chunks of data and each chunk of data, each partition block is essentially a piece of work that can be done and it can only be done by one CPU at a time. So that top one, I've got two tasks. That means I can be doing two bits of work at once and working through those two bits of read. And then I shuffle it and then I've got 12 tasks. I've got 12 chunks of data I can be processing independently in parallel. So you've got this idea of a job is all of my work, stages is my collections of tasks that I can do together, and a task is an independently processable bit of work that relates to a chunk of data. And I know that's a lot of stuff, but you get really used to it. And understanding that stuff when you're working through the notebooks is super, super useful anyway. Okay, so we've got our two things together. We've got our architecture, we've got our Spark cluster sitting there waiting to go. And then we've got this new job I've just submitted with my three stages and my different tasks. So tasks get done by slots. So a slot is a CPU waiting for some work. A task is a bit of work that can be done in isolation on a CPU at once. So when I'm doing stage one, I'm using two of those slots at that time. Now when they're finished and I start my next stage, I shuffle my data and I can then use 12 of my CPUs. Now again, I'm not using my full cluster there. And if I'm the only person on my cluster, that's not as efficient as it could be. Maybe I should have actually made sure it was creating 16 different blocks so I can actually use all of my cluster at once. If I had something in there that forced it into one big dirty great task, I can only use one of my executors. And I've got the rest of my clusters sitting there not doing anything. So have it in your mind that a task is how much work I'm doing in parallel at once. If I've got more tasks, then I've got slots, then I simply have to wait and queue them up. And then as soon as a task is finished, that slot becomes free. One of the tasks in the queue can go and start working and it goes on like that. And then again, I'm on my third stage, kind of using four of my um, slots at once. So whenever someone says, ah, oh, actually, can you, just, can you just fudge that job so it just creates one file at the end? And they're going, oh my God, but that means only one of my slots in my big old cluster, I'm gonna use one CPU to do this right. Suddenly everything slows down. So have that in the back of your mind that the number of tasks equates to how much parallelism you get out of trying to do the thing you're doing. And we're in Spark, everything is about parallelism. So be super careful with that. But hopefully that idea of jobs, stages, tasks, that should resonate with you. And I'll quickly show you a notebook with it in so you can kind of get an idea. So if we go out, just hop into Databricks. So I've just got an old notebook that I've ran some things on. So I just ran a quick merge statement going into Delta. Now that spun up a load of different jobs for me. So because it's Delta, it's doing things like read the transaction log, work out what that is in the transaction log, then do my actual query, then do some more stuff in the trans, trans log. But you can see the actual pulling out of data and the transformations in the action part, it had three stages. So I had three stages with eight tasks in, then it went up to 200 tasks. So it cut my data up, it did a shuffle and created 200 blocks. There's a reason for that. Um, and then it just returned one. And that's probably because it was doing something like a count. It was just returning a result so it could decide to do something later. So that idea, being able to go, what happened in this job? Oh, there were several stages. That means there was a shuffle. Oh, it's created a certain number of tasks. Oh, that means it did this kind of thing. It must have been a, a wide transformation that caused that. It allows you that deeper understanding of what's going on inside your Spark query when you actually submit a job. Now that 200, uh, that is a bit of a phenomenon in known in Spark. There's a command called shuffle. Um, so there's a config setting, which is your default shuffle um, partitions. And that's set by default to 200. And sometimes that has no relevance whatsoever to your actual cluster size. So it's just arbitrarily changing your uh, data size to 200 checks. And you can override that. And oftentimes you should override that because that's not the most efficient number in the world. Um, but it's good to see. So now if I'm working and I see 200, I'm like, oh, I've done an arbitrary shuffle. Maybe I should get involved and change how many partitions it's gonna to create to make it more efficient. It's like one of the little warning bells that you can be aware of. On the other side, when you're designing your cluster uh, and you're in your database client cluster design, you're going, right, okay, um, what, are they, what do these actually mean? Worker type, driver type? If you've got that idea of how many slots I have means how many things I can do in parallel, then picking your worker type and saying, well, how many calls does it have? Because that is saying 
exactly how many slots do I have per worker? And then how many workers do I have is how many slots do I have in total? So in this combination, I've got two workers, each of which has four calls. I've got eight slots. I can be doing eight tasks in parallel. So my 200, I'm going to have to be doing eight tasks and then the next day and the next day, all the way through until I get to my 200 tasks. So maybe I should have a lot fewer tasks. It allows you that knowledge of how do I tweak things and how do I actually make this stuff form a bit better. Okay, okay. So final thing is, yeah, you do get a nice shiny uh, certificate out of this. I got this two days later. So it's a nice quick turnaround. And as soon as you finish the exam, you hit submit and it'll tell you if you passed or failed. So it's a nice quick turnaround to get an idea of how, am I, how did I work? How did I do? Have I passed or not? You don't have that horrible nail biting. Am I going to pass or not? Wait. Uh, but it's still pretty good to actually get you to where you need to be. So that's your kind of Spark architecture stuff to kind of get you uh, to where you need to be. Uh, the one thing that you do get, so that kind of PDF version of the Spark documentation, it will help you out a hell of a lot if you're already familiar with that going in. So one of the bits of prep that I did, if you, I mean, if you just search, do a quick search for PySpark functions, uh, PySpark functions, and you'll get this. Now, one of the big things is because we're dealing with Spark 3.0, there is a new version of the Spark documentation. So there are 2.2, 2.4 versions. Um, make sure you're on the Spark 3.01, that'll have the most up to date. And you've got a few different sections in here. And that's quite intimidating. This is a big, big, big uh, document. And you're gonna have a PDF of it in the exam, which is great, but it's a lot of scrolling. Main things that you guys need to know about. Data frame, super useful. Anything you're doing on the data frame is in here. So if you're doing data frame dot read, if you're doing group by, if you're doing um, filter, you know, so the things that you're doing at the whole data frame level, they are all in this area. So it's really good to know, okay, well, cache, how does cache work? Okay, and you'll have this information, but knowing where to find it, gonna save you valuable time in that exam. So read through the data frame commands, make sure you're familiar with all of that stuff. Let's go right back to the top. The other one's functions. So these are the column level transformations that you can, make, can be doing. And again, knowing what that is, if someone says, okay, right, I need to know about, hmm, well, what should we say? The upper function, knowing that, because that is based on a column, you don't upper a whole data frame, you upper a column, so that's gonna be in the function section, and then you can go and find it in here. Knowing, is something expecting a column, or is it expecting a string reference that points to a column? That is huge, and that's something that trips up so many people all of the time, and you guys should be aware of that stuff. So one of the things I did is just, I literally just sat and ran through this thing going, right, okay, from Jason, that needs that, needs that, okay. And you don't need to memorize it, it's just that familiarity of, oh, I remember seeing that, it has a parameter, what's that parameter, I'll go and check in my documentation. So that familiarity of it will help you out a hell of a lot. Okay, so they're the main things, so if you can, Read the definitive guide to Spark, because it's super, super useful. Read through the PySpark function, get yourself used to it. If you don't already know the Spark architecture and how that hangs together and how that fits, definitely give yourself a refresher, just because it's super, super useful to understand that stuff. Now, if that all sounds like it is crazy far away and you have no idea how any of it fits together and it feels really intimidating, then you can get training. There's plenty of training courses out there. Databricks deliver training courses. Uh, while we're here, Advancing Analytics deliver training courses. So we do a lot of Databricks training and we focus on getting people so they actually understand enough to do the certification. And that's a nice way of ensuring people have learned enough to access sort of, uh, go and carry on their stuff. So just look out, find some training courses, get in touch if you want uh, to talk about it. But definitely find some training if you need it. Does everyone have to go through full training to get the certification? I don't think so. If you've been using Spark and you're used to data frames and you're used to transformations and actions and all of that kind of stuff, then just refreshing yourself from your documentation and giving the definitive guide a read, you'll be absolutely fine. But plenty of options out there to get you where you need to be. And yeah, hopefully, that's a challenge. Can you go out there now? Can you set a day, just book it in, get it in the calendar, say, I'm gonna take the exam on that day and then work towards it and hopefully pass? That's the plan. So there are no free retakes, unfortunately. So you do have to pass, but you can retake it as many times as you want. You just have to pay each time. Um, so yeah, give it a go. Let us know how you think. And yeah, we're sharing lots of content on here anyway. So maybe watching some of our other videos will actually help you out in preparing. But otherwise, don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time with some more tech deep dive content.
Cheers.